A Serious Case by Chris Rose I have a friend who is afraid of spiders. This isn't very unusual. A lot of people are afraid of spiders. I don't really like spiders much myself. I don't mind them if you see them outside in the garden as long as they're not too big. But if one comes in the house, especially if it's one of those really big spiders with furry legs and little red eyes, then I go yuck and I try to get rid of it. Usually I'll use a brush to get rid of the spider, but if I feel brave, then I'll put a glass over the top of it, slide a piece of paper under the glass, and then take it outside. This is quite normal, I think. But my friend isn't afraid of spiders in any normal way. She isn't just afraid of spiders, she is totally, completely and utterly terrified of them. When my friend sees a spider, she doesn't just go, ugh, or run away, or ask someone else to get rid of the horrible creepy crawly. Nope. She screams as loud as she possibly can. She screams so loud that her neighbours worry about her and think about calling the police. When she sees a spider, she shivers all over. And sometimes she freezes completely. She can't move at all because she is so terrified. Sometimes she even faints. But my friend had a surprise for me when we met for coffee last week. Guess what? she asked me. What? I said. I've got a new pet. Great, I said. What is it? A dog? A cat? No. A budgie? No. A rabbit? No. What then? I've got a pet spider. I don't believe you. It's true. I decided that it was time I did something about my phobia. So I went to visit a doctor. A special doctor. A psychiatrist. This psychiatrist specialised in phobias, helping people who had irrational fears to get better and live normally. He told me I suffered from arachnophobia. It's an irrational fear of spiders, he said. About one in fifty people suffer from a severe form of arachnophobia. It's not very uncommon. Thanks, said my friend. But that doesn't help me much. There are lots of different ways we can try to cure your phobia, said the psychiatrist. First, there is traditional analysis. What does that mean? asked my friend. This means lots of talking. We try to find out exactly why you have such a terrible fear of spiders. Perhaps it's linked to something that happened to you when you were a child. Oh dear, said my friend. That sounds quite worrying. It can take a long time, said the psychiatrist. Years sometimes, and you can never be certain that it will be successful. Are there any other methods? Yes. Some psychiatrists use hypnosis along with traditional analysis. My friend didn't like the idea of being hypnotised. I'm worried about what things will come out of my subconscious mind, she said. Are there any other methods? asked my friend. Well, said the psychiatrist, there is what we call the behavioural approach. What's the behavioural approach? asked my friend. Well, said the psychiatrist, it's like this. The psychiatrist got out a small spider from his desk. It wasn't a real spider, it was made of plastic. Even though it was only a plastic spider, my friend screamed when she saw it. Don't worry, said the psychiatrist. It's not a real spider. I know, said my friend. But I'm afraid of it just the same. Hmm, said the psychiatrist. A serious case. He put the rubber spider on the desk. When my friend stopped screaming, the psychiatrist told her to touch it. When she stopped screaming again, the idea of touching the plastic spider was enough to make her scream, she touched it. At first, she touched it for just one second. She shivered all over, but at least she managed to touch it. Okay, 
said the psychiatrist. That's all for today. Thanks. You can go home now. That's it? asked my friend. Yes. That's all? Yes, for today. This is the behavioural approach. Come back tomorrow. My friend went back the next day, and this time the plastic spider was already on the doctor's desk. This time she touched it and held it for five minutes. Then the doctor told her to go home and come back the next day. The next day she went back and the plastic spider was on her chair. She had to move the spider so she could sit down. The next day she held the spider in her hand while she sat in her chair. The next day the doctor gave her the plastic spider and told her to take it home with her. Where do spiders appear in your house? asked the psychiatrist. In the bath, usually, said my friend. Put the spider in the bath, he told her. My friend was terrified of the spider in the bath, but she managed not to scream when she saw it there. It's only a plastic spider, she told herself. The next day, the psychiatrist told her to put the spider in her living room. My friend put it on top of the television. At first, she thought the spider was watching her and she felt afraid. Then she told herself that it was only a plastic spider. The next day, the psychiatrist told her to put the spider in her bed. No way, she said. Absolutely not. Why not? asked the psychiatrist. It's a spider, replied my friend. No, it's not, said the psychiatrist. It's a plastic spider. It's not a real one. My friend realised that her doctor was right. She put the plastic spider in her bed and she slept there all night with it in her bed. She only felt a little bit afraid. The next day, she went back to the psychiatrist this time, she had a shock, a big shock. Sitting in the middle of the doctor's desk, there was a spider. And this time, it was a real spider. My friend was about to scream and run away, but she didn't. She sat on the other side of the room, as far away as possible from the spider for about five minutes. Then she got up and left the room. See you tomorrow! shouted the psychiatrist to her as she left. The next day she went back, and this time the psychiatrist let the spider run around on his desk. Again, my friend stayed about five minutes, then left. The next day she stayed for ten minutes, and the day after that, fifteen. Eventually, the psychiatrist held the spider, the real spider with long furry legs and little eyes, in his hand. He asked my friend to come and touch it. At first she refused, but the doctor insisted. Eventually she touched the spider, just for a second. The next day she touched it for a few seconds, then for a few minutes, and after that she held the spider in her own hand. Then she took the spider home and let it run around in her house. She didn't feel afraid. Well, OK, she did feel afraid, but only a tiny bit. So, now I've got a pet spider, she told me again. Well done, I said. There's only one problem, she said. And as she spoke, I noticed that she was shivering all over. Then she screamed and climbed up on the chair. She was pointing to something on the floor. Over there, she screamed. Look, it's a beetle. We are slow, silent people. We of the five towns. Perhaps it is because we make pottery, which is slow, silent work. There are many stories about us and how slow and silent we are. These stories often surprise the rest of the world very much. 
but we just laugh at them. Here is an example. Toby Hall was born in Turn Hill, the smallest of the five towns. Last New Year's Eve, he was travelling by train from Crewe to Derby, which was now his home town. He got out of the train at Knipe, in the centre of the five towns, for a quick drink. The station was busy, and he had to wait for his drink. When he returned to the train, it was already moving. Toby was not a young man. He couldn't jump on the train, so he missed it. He went to speak to the man in the station office. Young man, he asked. When's the next train to Derby? There isn't one before tomorrow. Toby went and had another drink. I'll go to Turn Hill, he said to himself slowly, and he paid for his drink. This was his first visit to the five towns for twenty-three years. But Knipe Station was still the same, and so were the times of the trains to Turn Hill. The train was the same too. In twenty minutes, he was leaving Turn Hill Station and walking into the town. He walked past a number of fine new buildings. In the town centre, almost everything was different. He walked on, into smaller streets, and at last came to Child Row. The old houses here were the same as always, and he looked at one small house very carefully. The light was on, so there was somebody at home. He crossed the street to the house. It was a special house for him. Number eleven it was and is, because twenty-four years ago it was his home. Twenty-four years ago, Toby Hall married Miss Priscilla Bratt a quiet woman of twenty-three. The house belonged to her. The two young people were perhaps not really in love, but they liked one another. Their only problem was the house. Priscilla often said that the house belonged to her. Toby knew that. Everybody in Turnhill knew that. She didn't have to say it so often. Toby asked her not to, but she didn't stop. He was happy to live in his wife's house, but he didn't want to hear about it every day. And after a year, it was too much. One day, he put some things in a bag, put on his hat and went to the door. Where are you going? asked Priscilla. He stopped for a minute, then answered, America. And he went. It was not difficult for Priscilla. She did not think that Toby was a very good husband. She could live without him. She had her house and some money. Toby went to the bank and got all his money and sailed off to New York on the Adriatic. From New York, he went to Trenton, New Jersey, which was the five towns of America. Toby was a good potter, and he found work easily. After a year, he asked a friend to write to Priscilla and tell her that he was dead. He wanted to be a free man, and it was only fair for her to be a free woman. After a few years, he returned to England. He changed his name from Hall and started work as a potter in Derby. He did well. 
The money was good, and he didn't have much to spend it on. He lived quietly, working all week and going fishing at the weekends. And now, because of a visit to Crewe, a train and a drink, he was in Child Row and crossing the street to number 11. He knocked on the door. Many doors in the five towns opened slowly and carefully, and so did this one. It opened a few centimetres, and a woman looked out at Toby. Is this Mrs Halls? he asked. No, it's not Mrs Halls. It's Mrs Tansley's. I thought... The door opened a little more. Is that you, Toby? It is, answered Toby, smiling a little. Well, well, said the woman. Well, well, the door opened a little more. Are you coming in, Toby? Yes, said Toby, and he went in. Sit down, said his wife. I thought you were dead. Someone wrote to me. Yes, said Toby. But I'm not dead. He sat down in a comfortable chair by the fire. He knew the chair and he knew the fire. He put his hat on the table. Priscilla locked the door again and sat down herself. Her dress was black, and like Toby, she was getting a little fat. Well, well, she said. So, you've come back? Yes. They were both silent for a minute. The weather's cold, isn't it? he said. Yes. It's been a cold winter. Another silence. What were they thinking and feeling? Perhaps they weren't thinking anything very much. And uh, what's the news? he asked. News? Oh, nothing special. There was a picture above the fire. It was a picture of Priscilla when she was young. It surprised Toby. I don't remember that picture, he said. What? That. He looked up at the picture. Oh, that. That's my daughter. Oh. Now Toby was surprised. I married Job Tansley, said Priscilla. He died four years ago. She's married, she said, looking up at her daughter's photograph. She married young Gibson last September. Well, well. They were silent again. That's a good fire, said Toby, looking at it. Yes, it is. Good coal. Seventy pence a ton. Again, they were silent. Is Ned Walk late still at the pub? Toby asked. I think so, said Priscilla. I think I'll go round and have a drink, said Toby, standing up. He was unlocking the door when Priscilla said, You've forgotten your hat, Toby. No, he answered. I haven't forgotten it. I'm coming back. They looked at one another, speaking without words. That'll be all right, she said. Well, well. Yes.
and he walked round to the pub. Cash on Delivery by Edmund Crispin Read by Chris Rowe Max Linster went through the small side gate and saw the large house in front of him. Not far away, a church clock told him that it was ten o'clock. He had half an hour to do the job. At midnight, a private plane would take off for Europe from a lonely field in Norfolk, and Linster planned to be on it, even if his last job in England was not successful. He walked towards the house and saw a room with a light on. He looked quickly through the window and saw that it was the servant's room. Then he moved round the building and climbed to the upstairs room that his orders had described. It was not difficult to reach, and the window was unlocked, as promised. He stepped inside and waited. After a moment, he heard someone coming and moved quickly and silently across to the door. He hid behind it. It opened slowly. Someone put on the light. The man who came in was about 35 years old. He had fair hair and the right arm of his coat was empty. Mr. Elliston, Linster said from behind him. Jacob Elliston turned quickly. He looked at Linster for a moment, then said, So you're the person they sent. I'm who they sent, agreed Linster. Elliston closed the door. We have to be quick, he said. You have guessed that this is my wife's bedroom. She's downstairs with her brother but he'll leave to catch his train in a minute or two and she'll come up to bed. Linster looked at his watch, but said nothing. Please understand, Elliston went on, that you will get no money if you don't succeed in killing the lady, Linster finished for him with a smile. Yes, I understand, Mr Elliston, it's cash on delivery. He stepped forward, carefully, because this was the first part of his plan. He was not like some other men he knew. He was not interested in murder if robbery could do the same job. You have the cash ready, I hope. Elliston took a gun from his pocket. Don't try that, he said. The money is safe in my bedroom. If you want it, you'll have to finish the job. Of course, said Linster, smiling. You must use both hands, said Elliston. Linster looked at the empty arm of the other man's coat. Yes, that's sensible, he said. They always look for clues like that. And you must pretend there was a burglary, said Elliston. Take that jewel box. There's nothing valuable in it, but you could not know that because it's locked. Still holding his gun, Elliston moved towards the door. I'm going to my bedroom where I shall turn my radio on loud. He opened the door a little. That's my wife's brother leaving now. She's tired and will come up almost at once. I'll return with the money in... 20 minutes. Elliston left and soon the sound of music came from another room. 
Linster looked around for a good place to hide and saw a clothes cupboard. He would not be able to see anything from inside it, but he could still hear. He turned off the light and disappeared into the cupboard like a shadow. Josephine de Monsieur, the young and pretty French servant, came into the bedroom and closed the door. In a bored and careless way, she got the bed ready for Mrs. Elliston. There was plenty of time, because Mrs. Elliston was walking to the railway station with her brother. It was something which she had decided to do at the last moment. Josephine looked around at the beautiful things which Mrs. Elliston owned. She put on one of the rings, then a pretty brooch. Next, she put on a short fur coat, which made her look very different when she saw herself in the mirror. I'm like a real lady, she thought. It was then that Linster moved out of the clothes cupboard. He went silently up behind her. He watched her face in the mirror and was still a metre or two away when she saw him and turned. But his left hand was large and fast. It closed around her narrow throat. She made no sound as she died. Linster gently put her body on the bed, then covered her with a blanket. It took only a few minutes to open cupboards and make them look untidy. He looked at the little jewel box, then threw it under the bed. When Elliston entered the room again, still with the gun in his hand, he looked at the shape under the blanket. He said, It... it's done? Yes, said Linster, it's done. You're sure she's... Yes, Mr Elliston... She's dead. Linster pulled a white hand from under the blanket. If you don't believe me, feel this. But Elliston jumped back, shaking. That ring, he said slowly. It's one she almost never... Linster dropped the hand. The money, Mr Elliston. Five thousand. The money was silently put into his hands. I'm going now, Mr Elliston, said Linster, and then, with a smile, said, Sorry I can't stay and talk to that pretty little servant that your wife has. Elliston looked surprised. The, the girl? The girl, said Linster. I looked through the window of your servant's room before I climbed up here, and there she was, dark, a soft-looking mouth, a pretty girl. I'd recognise her again anywhere. But I had this job to do, and you don't get paid until you've done the job, do you? It's cash on delivery, and a man must live. I don't understand what you're talking about said Elliston. But Linster was already climbing out of the window. You will, Mr Elliston, he said. You will. Coat from the Dead One evening, a man called James was on the road from Oxford to London. There weren't many cars on the road because it was late. Suddenly, in the lights of his car, he saw a woman by the road. She was quite young and very pretty. It's dangerous to walk along the road when it's dark and late, he thought. He stopped, opened the window and asked the young woman, Where are you going? It's dangerous to stand here at night. Perhaps I can take you to London with me. The young woman 
didn't answer, but she opened the door of the car and got in. James asked her a lot of questions. What's your name? Where do you live? Why are you on the road at night? Is your family in London? Where are your friends? Have you got any money? Are you hungry? The young woman sat next to James, but she said nothing. Not one word. She only looked at the road. Soon, James stopped asking questions, and they drove along without talking. Coming into London, there were more cars, and James had to drive more slowly. Suddenly, the young woman started to open the door, so James stopped the car quickly. They were in front of a house on a long street. The woman opened the door and got out of the car. Then she slowly walked up to the front door of the house. James watched her and thought angrily. She didn't say thank you. Three days later, he opened the back door of his car and found a coat. This isn't my coat, he thought. Then he remembered the young woman. Perhaps it was her coat. He had to drive to London again that evening, so he thought, I'll take her coat back. I remember the street and the house. He drove there, parked in front of the house, and walked up to the door. An older woman answered. Does a young woman live here? He asked. I think this is her coat. She left it in my car three days ago. The woman looked at the coat and began to cry. That was my daughter's coat. Here, please give it back to her then, James said. I can't, the woman said. She's dead. Dead? said James. Yes, she died five years ago. Five years ago? James asked quietly. Yes, on the road between Oxford and London, in an accident, the woman said. It was Christmas Eve. The Browns, who lived in the adjoining house, had been dining with the Joneses. Brown and Jones were sitting over wine and walnuts at the table, and the others had gone upstairs. "'What are you giving to your boy for Christmas?' asked Brown. "'A train,' said Jones. "'A new kind of thing. Automatic. Let's have a look at it,' said Brown. Jones fetched a parcel from the sideboard and began unwrapping it. "'Ingenious thing, isn't it?' he said. "'Goes on its own rails. Queer how kids love to play with trains, isn't it?' "'Yes,' assented Brown. "'How are the rails fixed?' "'Wait, I'll show you,' said Jones. "'Just help me shove these dinner things aside and roll back the cloth. "'There. See? You lay the rails like that and fasten them at the end. "'So, oh, yes, I catch on. Makes it great, doesn't it? "'Just the thing to amuse a child, isn't it? "'I got Willie a toy aeroplane. "'I know, they're great. I got Edwin one on his birthday. "'But I thought I'd get him a train this time.' I told him Santa Claus was going to bring him altogether something new this time. Edwin, of course, believes in Santa Claus absolutely. Say, look at this locomotive, would you? It has a spring coiled up inside the firebox. Wind her up, said Brown with great interest. Let's see her go. All right, said Jones. Just pile up two or three plates or something to lean the end of the rails on. There, notice the way it buzzes before it starts. Isn't that a great thing for a kid, eh? Yes, said Brown, and say, see this little string to pull the whistle? By God, it toots, too, eh? Just like real. Now then, Brown, Jones went on, you hitch on those cars, and I'll start her. I'll be engineer, eh? Half an hour later, Brown and Jones were still playing trains on the dining-room table, but their wives upstairs in the drawing-room hardly noticed their absence. They were too much interested. "'Oh, I think it's perfectly sweet,' said Mrs. Brown. "'Just the loveliest doll I've seen in years. 
I must get one like it for old Vina. One Clarice will be perfectly enchanted. Yes, answered Mrs. Jones, and then she'll be, then she'll have all the fun of arranging the dresses. Children love that so much. Look, there are three little dresses with the doll, aren't they cute? All cut out and ready to stitch together. Oh, how perfectly lovely! exclaimed Mrs. Brown. I think the mauve one would suit the doll best, don't you? With such golden hair. Only, don't you think it would make it much nicer to turn back the collar, so, and, and put a little band, so? Well, what a good idea, said Mrs. Jones. Do let's try it. Now just wait, I'll get a needle in a minute. I'll tell Clarice that Santa Claus sewed it himself. The child believes in Santa Claus absolutely. And half an hour later, Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Brown were so busy stitching doll's clothes that they could not hear the roaring of the little train up and down the dining table and had no idea what the four children were doing. Nor did the children miss their mothers. "'Dandy, aren't they?' Edwin Jones was saying to little Willie Brown as they sat in Edwin's bedroom. "'A hundred in a box, with cork tips and see, an amber mouthpiece that fits into a little case at the side. Good present for Dad, eh?' "'Oh, fine,' said Willie appreciatively. "'I'm giving Father cigars.' "'I know. I thought of cigars, too. Men always like cigars and cigarettes. You can't go wrong on them. Say, would you like to try one or two of these cigarettes? We can take them from the bottom. You'll like them. They're Russian, away ahead of Egyptian.' "'Thanks,' answered Willie. "'I'd like one immensely. I only started smoking last spring on my twelfth birthday.' I think a feller's a fool to begin smoking cigarettes too soon, don't you? It stunts him. I waited till I was twelve. Me too, said Edwin, as they lighted their cigarettes. In fact, I wouldn't buy them now if it weren't for Dad. I simply had to give him something from Santa Claus. He believes in Santa Claus absolutely, you know. And while this was going on, Clarice was showing little Olvina the absolutely lovely little bridge set that she got for her mother. "'Aren't these markers perfectly charming?' said Olvina. "'And don't you love this little Dutch design? Or, "'Or is it Flemish, darling?' "'Dutch,' said Clarice. "'Isn't it quaint? "'And aren't these the dearest little things "'for putting the money in when you play? "'I needn't have got them with it. "'They'd have sold the rest separately. "'But I think it's too utterly slow playing without money, don't you?' "'Oh, abominable!' shuddered Olvina. "'But your mamma never plays for money, does she?' Mamma. "'Oh, gracious, no! Mamma's far too slow for that. "'But I shall tell her that Santa Claus insisted on putting in the little money-boxes. "'I suppose she believes in Santa Claus just as my mamma does.' "'Oh, absolutely,' said Clarice, and added, "'What if we play a little game? "'With a double dummy, the French way, or, or Norwegian scat, if you like. "'That only needs two. "'All right,' agreed Elvina, and in a few minutes... They were deep in a game of cards, with a little pile of pocket-money beside them. About half an hour later, all the members of the two families were down again in the drawing-room, but, of course, nobody said anything about the presents. In any case, they were all too busy looking at the beautiful big Bible with maps in it that the Joneses had bought to give to Grandfather. They all agreed that with the help of it, Grandfather could hunt up any place in Palestine in a moment, day or night. But upstairs, away upstairs in a sitting-room all of his own, Grandfather Jones was looking with an affectionate eye at the presents that stood beside him. There was a beautiful whiskey decanter with silver filigree outside and whiskey inside for Jones and for the little boy, a big nickel-plated Jew's harp. Later on, far in the night, the person, or the influence, or whatever it is called Santa Claus, took all the presents and placed them in the people's stockings. And, being blind as he always has been, he gave the wrong things to the wrong people. In fact, he gave them just as indicated above. But the next day, in the course of Christmas morning, the situation straightened itself out, just as it always does. Indeed, by ten o'clock, Brown and Jones were playing with the train, and Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Jones were making dolls' clothes, and the boys were smoking cigarettes, 
and Clarice and Alvina were playing cards for their pocket money. And upstairs, way up, Grandfather was drinking whiskey and playing the Jew's harp. And so, Christmas, just as it always does, turned out all right after all. As the Inspector Said by Cyril Hare Read by Richard Mitchley It is impossible to say when Charles Darrell and Sonia French first decided to murder Sonia's husband, Robert. Robert was nearly twice as old as Sonia, and he married her ten years before Charles Darrell came into her life. For eight of those years, Sonia was bored with her husband, although he did not seem to realise this. He was more interested in his books and the silver which he bought. Sonia and Charles were lovers for six months before things became difficult. People were beginning to talk, and it could not be long before Robert found out about them. Robert will never give me a divorce, thought Sonia, and Charles and I have no money of our own. But Sonia knew that Robert's silver alone was worth enough money to make life very comfortable for her and Charles. By a strange accident, it was a policeman who gave them the idea for their murder plan. The inspector made a surprise visit to the French's house one evening. Charles was also there. He often came in for a drink. There have been several burglaries near here, the inspector told Robert, and we haven't caught the burglar. We know who he is, and it can't be long before we catch him, but we're very worried. He carries a gun, and we're almost sure he has killed a man. Now this house is in a very lonely place. Mr. Darrell is your only neighbour. You also have a lot of valuable silver. What are you trying to say? asked Robert. I'm saying that it's sensible to be careful, said the inspector. Very careful. Why not put your silver in the bank until the burglar is caught? I don't want to do that, said Robert. The inspector tried not to sound angry. Well, I have warned you, sir, he said. Please remember that. The inspector left, and Charles said, The inspector didn't warn me. He knows I've nothing worth stealing. But if this gunman does visit me, he'll be sorry. I have a gun, and I won't think twice before using it. He was tall and strong, and Sonia thought he was very good-looking. And she did not try to hide her feelings. I feel sorry for the burglar who tries to frighten you, Charles, she said. Three nights later, Sonia was lying awake in her bed. Robert was asleep. It was ten minutes to two. Sonia was excited. Ten minutes before Charles enters the house, she thought. It was ten long minutes. And then she heard a noise. Glass breaking, followed by the sound of a window as it was pushed up. Robert did not wake up. Sonia waited until she heard the sound of Charles climbing through the open window. Then she reached across to Robert's bed. Robert! She was shaking him. Wake up! There's somebody downstairs! Robert woke slowly. What? Someone downstairs? No, I'm sure you're... He sat up in bed, awake now. There is someone. I'll have to go down, I suppose. 
he put on his old grey dressing gown and went out of the room. Sonia waited in the dark. It seemed a very long wait, but it was less than half a minute. Then a thin line of light appeared under the bedroom door. Sonia heard her husband give a sudden cry. Then she heard a gun explode. Something or someone heavy fell to the floor. Then a door was banged open and there was the sound of running feet outside the house. Sonia waited. Charles must have time to escape before I call the police, she thought. She put on her bedside light and got out of bed. Now it was all over, she felt strangely calm. She knew what she was going to say to the police. How soon could she marry Charles? Six months from now? They could go to Venice for a holiday after they were married. She had always wanted to see Venice. Then the door opened, and Robert walked in. For a long moment, Sonia could only look at him, her stomach sick with fear. He looked back at her, silent, white-faced and untidy, but alive. What? What happened? she said. He got away, said Robert. I'm afraid he's taken some of my best silver with him. I wish now I had listened to the inspector and sent it to the bank. But I heard a gun, said Sonia. I thought you... you're not hurt, Robert. No, Sonia, I'm not hurt, said Robert. But I have some bad news. It's Charles. I think the dear brave man was watching the house and followed the burglar in to try and help us. He is at the bottom of the stairs. I am afraid there is nothing that we can do for him. Sonia fell forwards, her eyes closing, and Robert caught her. He carried her to the bed, then went downstairs. When he reached the bottom, he had to step over the body. He did this calmly, stepping around the blood on the carpet. But when he walked into the room where he kept his silver, he wanted to cry. All of the best pieces were gone. He closed the door and went into his study. But before he telephoned the police, he was careful to clean the small gun that was in his dressing gown pocket. Then he locked it inside his desk. He had taken care of the one problem in his usually very tidy life, and he wanted to make sure he would have no more trouble. As the inspector said, it was sensible to be careful. Lost Love These things happened to me nearly ten years ago. I lived in a city, but the city was hot in summer. I wanted to see the country. I wanted to walk in the woods and see green trees. I had a little red car, and I had a map too. I drove all night out into the country. I was happy in my car. We had a very good summer that year. The country was very pretty in the early morning. The sun was hot and the sky was blue. I heard the birds in the trees. And then my car stopped suddenly. What's wrong? I thought. Oh, dear, I haven't got any petrol. Now I'll have to walk. I'll have to find a town and buy some petrol. But where am I? I looked at the map. 
I wasn't near a town. I was lost in the country. And then I saw the girl. She walked down the road with flowers in her hand. She wore a long dress, and her hair was long, too. It was long and black, and it shone in the sun. She was very pretty. I wanted to speak to her, so I got out of the car. Hello, I said. I'm lost. Where am I? She looked afraid, so I spoke quietly. I haven't got any petrol, I said. Where can I find some? Her blue eyes looked at me, and she smiled. She's a very pretty girl, I thought. I do not know, she said. Come with me to the village. Perhaps we can help you. I went with her happily, and we walked a long way. There isn't a village on the map, I thought. Perhaps it's a very small village. There was a village, and it was old and pretty. The houses were black and white and very small. There were a lot of animals. The girl stopped at a house and smiled at me. Come in, please, she said. I went in. The house was very clean, but it was strange too. There was a fire and some food above it. I felt hungry then. That's strange, I thought. They cook their food over a wood fire. Perhaps they have no money. I met her father and mother, and I liked them. They were nice people, but their clothes were strange. Sit down, said the old man. Are you thirsty after your walk? He gave me a drink, and I said, Thank you. But the drink was strange, too. It was dark brown and very strong. I didn't understand. But I was happy there. I asked about petrol, but the old man didn't understand. Petrol? he asked. What is that? This is strange, I thought. Then I asked, Do you walk everywhere? The old man smiled. Oh, no. We use horses, he said. Horses? I thought. Horses are very slow. Why don't they have cars? But I didn't say that to the old man. I felt happy there. I stayed all day, and I ate dinner with them that evening. Then the girl and I went out into the garden. The girl's name was Mary. This is nice, she said. We like having visitors. We do not see many people here. We spoke happily. She was very beautiful. But after a time, she began to talk quietly, and her face was sad. Why are you sad? I asked her. I cannot tell you, she said. You are only a visitor here. We have to say goodbye tonight. You have to go now. I didn't understand. I loved her. I knew that. And I wanted to help her. Why did I have to go? But Mary said again in a sad voice, You have to go. It is dangerous here. So I said, I'll go to the next town and find some petrol. Then I'll come back. She didn't speak. I love you, Mary, I said, and I'll come back to you. You won't stop me. She said goodbye to me at the door. 
Her face was very sad. And I was sad too. I didn't want to go. It was midnight. The night was very dark, but I walked and walked. I was very tired when I saw the lights of a town. I found some petrol, and then I asked the name of the village. But the man at the garage gave me a strange look. What village? he asked. I told him about the village. I told him about the old houses and the people with strange clothes. Again, he gave me a strange look. He thought, and then he said, There was a village there, but it isn't there now. There are stories about it, strange stories. What do people say about it? I asked. He didn't want to tell me, but then he said, There was a big fire in the village. Everybody died. There aren't any people or houses there now. How did it happen? I asked. And why? Oliver Cromwell killed them, he said. He was angry with the villagers because they helped the king in the war. I couldn't speak. This isn't right, I thought. That war happened three hundred and fifty years ago. Then I remembered the strange clothes, the long hair, the food over the fire, and the old houses. And I remembered, too, about the horses. But I don't understand, I cried. I saw the people and the village. I spoke to some people there. The man looked quickly at me, and then he spoke. There's an interesting story about the village. For one day, every ten years, it lives again, but only for one day. Then it goes away again for another ten years. On that one day, you can find the village, but you have to leave before morning, or you will never leave. Can this be right? I thought. Perhaps it was. Mary said, You have to go. She loved me, but she said, We have to say goodbye. She was afraid for me. Now I understand, I thought. I went back to the village, but it wasn't there. I looked again and again, but I couldn't find it. I saw only flowers and trees. I heard only the sound of the birds and the wind. I was very sad. I sat down on the ground and cried. I will never forget that day. I remember Mary, and I will always love her. Now, I only have to wait two months. The village will come back again. On the right day, I will go back. I will find her again, my love with the long black hair. And this time, I will not leave before morning. I will stay with her. Man from the South It was almost six o'clock so I thought I'd buy a beer and go out and sit by the swimming pool and have a little evening sun. I went to the bar and got the beer and carried it outside and wandered down the garden. It was a fine garden, and there were plenty of chairs around the pool. There were white tables and huge brightly coloured umbrellas and sunburned men and women sitting around in bathing suits. In the pool itself there were three or four girls and about a dozen boys, all splashing about and making a lot of noise and throwing a large rubber ball at one another. I stood watching them. The girls were English girls from the hotel. I didn't know about the boys, but they sounded American, and I thought they were probably young sailors from the American ship which had arrived in harbour that morning. 
I went over and sat down under a yellow umbrella where there were four empty seats and I poured my beer and settled back comfortably with a cigarette. It was pleasant to sit and watch the bathers splashing about in the green water. The American sailors were getting on nicely with the English girls. They'd reached the point where they were diving under the water and pulling the girls up by their legs. Just then I noticed a small old man walking quickly around the edge of the pool. He was beautifully dressed in a white suit and a cream-coloured hat, and as he walked he was looking at the people and the chairs. He stopped beside me and smiled. I smiled back. Excuse me, please, but may I sit here? Certainly, I said. Go ahead. He inspected the back of the chair for safety. Then he sat down and crossed his legs. A fine evening, he said. They are all fine evenings here in Jamaica. I couldn't tell if his accent was Italian or Spanish, but I felt sure he was some sort of a South American. He was old, too, when you looked at him closely probably around 68 or 70. Yes, I said. It's wonderful here, isn't it? And who are all these? These are not hotel people. He was pointing at the bathers in the pool. I think they're American sailors, I told him. Of course they are Americans. Who else in the world is going to make as much noise as that? You are not American, no? No, I said, I am not. Suddenly, one of the young sailors was standing in front of us. He was still wet from the pool, and one of the English girls was standing there with him. Are these chairs free? he said. Yes, I answered. Mind if I sit down? Go ahead. Thanks, he said. He had a towel in his hand, and when he sat down, he unrolled it and produced a packet of cigarettes and a lighter. He offered the cigarettes to the girl, but she refused. Then he offered them to me, and I took one. The old man said, Thank you, no, but I think I will have a cigar. He took a cigar out of his pocket. Then he produced a knife and cut the end off it. Here, let me give you a light. The American boy held up his lighter. That will not work in this wind. Sure it'll work. It always works. The old man removed the cigar from his mouth, moved his head to one side, and looked at the boy. Always? he said slowly. Sure, it never fails. Not with me, anyway. Well, well. So you say this famous lighter never fails. Is that what you say? Sure, the boy said. That's right. He was about nineteen or twenty, with pale skin and a rather sharp nose. He was holding the lighter in his hand, ready to turn the little wheel. He said, I promise you, it never fails. One moment, please. The hand that held the cigar came up high as if it was stopping traffic. Now just one moment. He had a curiously soft voice and kept looking at the boy all the time. He smiled. Shall we not make a little bet on whether your lighter lights? Sure, I'll bet, the boy said. Why not? You like to bet? Sure, I'll always bet. The man paused and examined his cigar. And I must say I didn't much like the way he was behaving. It seemed he was trying to embarrass the boy. And at the same time, I had the feeling he was enjoying a private little secret. He looked up again at the boy and said slowly, I like to bet too. Why don't we have a bet on this thing? A big bet. Now, wait a minute, the boy said. I can't do that. But I'll bet you a dollar. I'll even bet you ten, or whatever the money is over here. The old man waved his hand again. Listen to me. Let's have some fun. We make a bet. Then we go up to my room here in the hotel, where there's no wind. 
and I bet you cannot light this famous lighter of yours ten times, one after another, without missing once. I'll bet I can, the boy said. All right, good. We make a bet, yes? Sure, I'll bet you ten dollars. No, no, I am a rich man, and I am a sporting man also. Listen to me. Outside the hotel is my car. It's a very fine car. An American car from your country. Cadillac. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. The boy leaned back and laughed. I can't offer you anything like that. This is crazy. It's not crazy at all. You strike the lighter successfully ten times, and the Cadillac is yours. You'd like to have this Cadillac, yes? Sure, I'd like to have a Cadillac. The boy was still smiling. All right, fine. We make a bet, and I offer my Cadillac. <laughs> What do I offer? The old man said, I never ask you, my friend, to bet something that you cannot afford. You understand? So, what do I bet? I'll make it easy for you, yes? Okay, you make it easy. Some small thing you can afford to give away. And if you did lose it, you would not feel too bad, right? Like what? Like, perhaps, the little finger on your left hand? My what? The boy stopped smiling. Yes, why not? You win, you take the car. You lose, I take the finger. I, I don't understand. How do you mean, you take the finger? I chop it off. <laughs> That's crazy. I think I'll just bet ten dollars. Well, 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 the old man said. I do not understand. You say it lights, but you will not bet. Then we forget it, yes? The boy sat quite still, staring at the bathers in the pool. Then he remembered that he hadn't lit his cigarette. He put it between his lips, opened the lighter and turned the wheel. It lit and burned with a small, steady yellow flame. And the way he held his hands meant that the wind didn't get to it at all. Could I have a light too? I said. God, I'm sorry. I forgot you didn't have one. He stood up and came over to light my cigarette. There was a silence then, and I could see that the old man had succeeded in disturbing the boy with his ridiculous suggestion. He was sitting there very still, obviously tense. Then he started moving about in his seat and rubbing his chest and stroking the back of his neck. Finally, he placed both hands on his knees and began tapping his fingers against them. Soon he was tapping with one of his feet, too. Now, just let me check I understand, he said at last. You say we go up to your room, and if I make this lighter light ten times, one time after another, I win a Cadillac. If it misses just once... Then I lose the little finger of my left hand. Is that right? Certainly. That is the bet. But I think you are afraid. What do we do if I lose? Do I have to hold my finger out while you chop it off? Oh, no. That would not be good. And you might refuse to hold it out. What I would do is tie one of your hands to the table before we started, and I would stand there with a knife, ready to chop the moment your lighter missed. How old is the Cadillac? How old? It is last year's. Quite a new car. But I see you are not a betting man. Americans never are. The boy paused for a moment, and he glanced first at the English girl, than at me. Yes, he said suddenly. I'll bet you. Good, 
The old man clapped his hands together. Fine, he said. We will do it now. And you, sir, he turned to me, you would perhaps be good enough to, uh, what do you call it, to, to referee. Well, I said, I think it's a crazy bet. I don't like it very much. Neither do I, said the English girl. It was the first time she'd spoken. I think it's a stupid, ridiculous bet. Are you serious about cutting off this boy's finger if he loses? I said. Certainly I am. Also about giving him my Cadillac if he wins. Come now. We will go to my room. Would you like to put on some clothes first? He said to the boy. No, the boy answered. I'll come like this. Then he turned to me. I'd consider it a favor if you'd come along as a referee. All right, I said. I'll come along, but I don't like the bet. You come too, he said to the girl. You come and watch. The old man led the way back through the garden to the hotel. He was excited now, and that seemed to make him walk with more energy. Would you like to see the car first? It's just here. He took us to a pale green Cadillac. There it is, the green one. You like? That's a nice car, the boy said. All right. Now we will go up and see if you can win her. We all went up the stairs and into a large, pleasant double bedroom. There was a woman's dress lying across the bottom of one of the beds. First, he said, let's have a little drink. The drinks were on a small table in the far corner, all ready to be poured, and there was ice and plenty of glasses. He began to pour the drinks, and then he rang the bell, and a little later there was a knock at the door, and a maid came in. Ah, he said, putting down the bottle, and giving her a pound note. You will do something for me now, please. We are going to play a little game in here, and I want you to go off and find for me two, no, three things. I want some nails, I want a hammer, and I want a big knife, a butcher's knife, which you can borrow from the kitchen. You can get these, yes? A butcher's knife? The maid opened her eyes wide. You mean a real butcher's knife? Yes, of course. Come on now, please. You can find those things surely for me. Yes, sir, I'll try. I'll try to get them. And she went. The old man handed round the drinks. We stood there drinking. The boy, the English girl, who watched the boy over the top of her glass all the time. The little old man with the colourless eyes standing there in his elegant white suit, drinking and looking at the girl. I didn't know what to think about it all. The man seemed serious about the bed, and he seemed serious about the business of cutting off the finger. But what would we do if the boy lost? Then we'd have to rush him to hospital in the Cadillac that he hadn't won. It would all be a stupid, unnecessary thing, in my opinion. Before we begin, the old man said, I will present to the, to the referee the key of the car. He produced the key from his pocket and gave it to me. The papers, he said, and the insurance are in the pocket of the car. Then the maid came in again. In one hand she carried a butcher's knife, and in the other a hammer and a bag of nails. Good! You got them all. Thank you, thank you. Now you can go. He waited until she had gone. Then he put the things on one of the beds and said, Now we will prepare ourselves, yes? The old man moved the little hotel writing desk away from the wall and removed the writing things. And now, he said, a chair. He picked up a chair and placed it beside the table. And now the nails. I must put in the nails. He fetched the nails and began to hammer them into the top of the table. We stood there, the boy, the girl and I, watching the man at work. We watched him hammer two nails into the table, about fifteen centimetres apart, allowing a small part of each one to stick up. 
Then he tested that they were firm with his fingers. Anyone would think that he had done this before, I told myself. He never hesitated. Table, nails, hammer, knife. He knows exactly what he needs and how to arrange it. And now, he said, all we want is some string. He found some string. All right. At last we are ready. Will you please sit here at the table? He said to the boy. The boy sat down. Now place the left hand between these two nails. The nails are only so that I can tie your hand in place. All right, good. Now I tie your hand securely to the table. Like that. He tied the string around the boy's wrist, then several times around the wide part of the hand. Then he tied it tightly to the nails. When he finished, it was impossible for the boy to pull his hand away. But he could move his fingers. Now, please, make a fist, all except for the little finger. You must leave the little finger sticking out, lying on the table. Excellent, excellent. Now we are ready. With your right hand, you light the lighter. But one moment, please. He hurried over to the bed and picked up the knife. He came back and stood beside the table with the knife in his hand. We are all ready, he said. Mr. Referee, you must say when to begin. Are you ready? I asked the boy. I'm ready. And you? To the old man. Quite ready, he said. And he lifted the knife up in the air and held it there about sixty centimetres above the boy's finger, ready to cut. The boy watched it, but he didn't react, and his mouth didn't move at all. He only raised his eyebrows all and right, frowned, I said. Go ahead. The boy said, Will you please count aloud the number of times I light it? Yes, I said, I'll do that. With his thumb he raised the top of his lighter, and again with his thumb he turned the wheel sharply. There appeared a small yellow flame. One, I called. He didn't blow the flame out. He closed the top of the lighter on it and waited for perhaps five seconds before opening it again. He turned the wheel very strongly, and once more there was a small flame. Two. No one else said anything. The boy kept his eyes on the lighter. The man held the knife up in the air, and he too was watching the lighter. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Obviously, it was one of those lighters that worked. I watched the thumb closing the top down onto the flame. Then a pause. Then the thumb raising the top once more. The thumb did everything. I took a breath, ready to say eight. The thumb turned the wheel. The little flame appeared. Eight, I said. And as I said it, the door opened. We all turned, and we saw a woman standing in the doorway, a small black-haired woman, rather old, who stood there for about two seconds, then rushed forward, shouting, Carlos! Carlos! She grabbed his wrist, took the knife from him, threw it on the bed, took hold of the man by his jacket, and began shaking him with great strength, talking to him fast and loud and fiercely all the time in some Spanish-sounding language. She pulled the old man across the room and pushed him backwards onto one of the beds. I am sorry, the woman said. I am so terribly sorry that this should happen. She spoke almost perfect English. It is too bad, she went on. I suppose it is really my fault. For ten minutes I left him alone to go and have my hair washed. And I come back and he is doing it again. The boy was untying his hand from the table. The English girl and I stood there and said nothing. He is a danger to others, the woman said. Where we live at home, he has taken altogether forty-seven fingers from different people, and he has lost eleven cars. 
In the end, they threatened to put him away somewhere. That's why I brought him up here. We were only having a little bet, whispered the old man. I suppose he bet you a car, the woman said. Yes, the boy answered. A Cadillac. He has no car. It's mine. And that makes it worse, she said. He has bet you when he has nothing to bet with. I am ashamed and very sorry about it all. She seemed a very nice woman. Well, I said, then here's the key to your car. I put it on the table. We were only having a little bet, whispered the old man again. He hasn't anything left to bet with, the woman said. He hasn't a thing in the world, not a thing. In fact, I myself won it all from him a long time ago. It was hard work, but I won it all in the end. She looked up at the boy and she smiled, a slow, sad smile. And she came over and put out a hand to take the key from the table. I can see it now, that hand of hers. It had only one finger on it, and a thumb. Mr. Harris and the Night Train Mr. Harris liked trains. He was afraid of aeroplanes and didn't like buses. But trains, they were big and noisy and exciting. When he was a boy of ten, he liked trains. Now he was a man of fifty, and he still liked trains. So he was a happy man on the night of the 14th of September. He was on the night train from Helsinki to Ulu in Finland, and he had ten hours in front of him. I've got a book and my newspaper, he thought, and there's a good restaurant on the train. And then I've got two weeks' holiday with my Finnish friends in Ulu. There weren't many people on the train, and nobody came into Mr. Harris's carriage. He was happy about that. Most people on the train slept through the night, but Mr. Harris liked to look out of the window and to read and think. After dinner in the restaurant, Mr. Harris came back to his carriage and sat in his seat next to the window. For an hour or two he watched the trees and lakes of Finland out of the window. Then it began to get dark, so he opened his book and began to read. At midnight the train stopped at the small station of Ottawa. Mr. Harris looked out of the window, but he saw nobody. The train moved away from the station into the black night again. Then the door of Mr. Harris's carriage opened and two people came in, a young man and a young woman. The young woman was angry. She closed the door and shouted at the man, Carl! You can't do this to me! The young man laughed loudly and sat down. Mr. Harris was a small, quiet man. He wore quiet clothes and he had a quiet voice. He did not like noisy people and loud voices, so he was not pleased. Young people are always noisy, he thought. Why can't they talk quietly? He put his book down and closed his eyes. But he could not sleep, because the two young people didn't stop talking. The young woman sat down and said in a quieter voice, Carl, you're my brother and I love you, but please listen to me. You can't take my diamond necklace. Give it back to me now, please. Carl smiled. No, Elena, he said. I'm going back to Russia soon and I'm taking your diamonds with me. He took off his hat and put it on the seat. Elena, listen. You have a rich husband, but I, I have no money. I have nothing. 
How can I live without money? You can't give me money, so I need your diamonds, little sister. Mr. Harris looked at the young woman. She was small, with black hair and dark eyes. Her face was white and afraid. Mr. Harris began to feel sorry for Elena. She and her brother didn't look at him once. Can't they see me? He thought. Carl, Elena said. Her voice was very quiet now, and Mr. Harris listened carefully. You came to dinner at our house tonight, and you went to my room and took my diamond necklace. How could you do that to me? My husband gave the diamonds to me. They were his mother's diamonds before that. He's going to be very, very angry, and I'm afraid of him. Her brother laughed. He put his hand in his pocket, then took it out again, and opened it slowly. The diamond necklace in his hand was very beautiful. Mr. Harris stared at it. For a minute or two, nobody moved, and it was quiet in the carriage. There was only the noise of the train, and it went quickly on through the dark, cold night. Mr. Harris opened his book again, but he didn't read it. He watched Carl's face with its hungry eyes and its cold smile. What beautiful, beautiful diamonds! Carl said. I can get a lot of money for these. Give them back to me, Carl, Elena whispered. My husband's going to kill me. You're my brother. Please help me, please. Carl laughed again, and Mr. Harris wanted to hit him. Go home, little sister," Carl said. "I'm not going to give the diamonds back to you. Go home to your angry husband." Suddenly, there was a knife in the young woman's hand—a long, bright knife. Mr. Harris watched with his mouth open. He couldn't speak or move. "Give the diamonds back to me," Elena cried, "or I'm going to kill you." Her hand on the knife was white. Carl laughed and laughed. "What a sister," he said. "What a kind, sweet sister." No, they're my diamonds now. Put your knife away, little sister. But the knife in the white hand moved quickly, up then down. There was a long, terrible cry, and Carl's body fell slowly onto the seat. The color of the seat began to change to red, and the diamond necklace fell from Carl's hand onto the floor. Elena's face was white. "Oh no," she whispered. "Carl, come back, come back! I didn't want to kill you." But Carl didn't answer, and the red blood ran slowly over the floor. Elena put her head in her hands. And again in the carriage, there was a long, terrible cry. Mr. Harris's face was white too. He opened his mouth, but he couldn't speak. He stood up, and carefully moved to the door. The young woman was quiet now. She didn't move or look up at Mr. Harris. In the corridor, Mr. Harris ran. The guard was at the back of the train, and Mr. Harris got there in half a minute. Quickly, Mr. Harris said. Come quickly, an accident, a young woman. Oh dear, her brother is, he's dead. The guard ran with Mr. Harris back to the carriage. Mr. Harris opened the door and they went inside. There was no dead body of a young man. There was no young woman, no blood, no knife, no diamond necklace. Only Mr. Harris's bags and his hat and coat. The guard looked at Mr. Harris, and Mr. Harris looked at him. But, Mr. Harris began. But they were here. I saw them. She, the young woman, she had a knife, and she, she killed her brother. A knife, you say? The guard asked. Yes, Mr. Harris said quickly. A long knife, 
and her brother took her diamonds, so she... Ah, diamonds, the guard said. Was the young woman's name Elena? he asked. Yes, it was, Mr. Harris said. How do you know that? Do you... do you know her? Yes, and no, the guard said slowly. He thought for a minute, then looked at Mr. Harris. Elena di Saronelli, he said. She had dark eyes and black hair. Very beautiful. She was half Italian, half Finnish. Her brother was a half-brother. They had the same father, but his mother was Russian, I think. Was? Had? Mr. Harris stared at the guard. But she, Elena, she's alive. And where is she? Oh, no, said the guard. Elena di Saronelli died about eighty years ago. After she killed her brother with a knife, she jumped off the train and died at once. It was near here, I think. He looked out of the window into the night. Mr. Harris's face was very white again. Eighty years ago, he whispered. What are you saying? Was she and her brother? But I saw them. Yes, that's right, the guard said. You saw them, but they're not alive. They're ghosts. They often come on the night train at this time in September. I never see them, but somebody saw them last year. A man and his wife. They were very unhappy about it. But what can I do? I can't stop Elena and Carl coming on the train. The guard looked at Mr. Harris's white face. You need a drink, he said. Come and have a vodka with me. Mr. Harris didn't usually drink vodka, but he felt afraid. When he closed his eyes, he could see again Elena's long knife and could hear her terrible cry. So he went with the guard to the back of the train. After the vodka, Mr. Harris felt better. He didn't want to sleep, and the guard was happy to talk. So Mr. Harris stayed with the guard and didn't go back to his carriage. Yes, the guard said. It's a famous story. I don't remember it all. It happened a long time ago, of course. Elena's father was a famous man here in Finland. He was very rich once, but he had three or four wives and about eight children. And he liked the good things of life, so there wasn't much money for the children. Carl, the oldest son, was a bad man, people say. He wanted an easy life and money in his hand all the time. The train hurried on to Ulu through the black night, and the guard drank some more vodka. Now, Elena, he said, she didn't have an easy life with those three difficult men, her father, her brother, her husband. One year she visited her mother's family in Italy, and there she met her husband, Di Saronelli. He was rich, but he wasn't a kind man. They came back to Finland, and Carl often visited their house. He wanted money from his sister's rich husband. Elena loved her brother and gave him some money, but Di Saronelli didn't like Carl and was angry with Elena. He stopped giving her money, and after that, well, you know the story now. Yes, Mr. Harris said. Poor, unhappy Elena. Mr. Harris stayed with his friends in Ulu for two weeks. They were quiet weeks, and Mr. Harris had a good holiday. But he took the bus back to Helsinki. The bus was slow, and there were a lot of people on it. But Mr. Harris was very happy. 
he didn't want to take the night train across Finland again. It was raining as I got off the train in Nashville, Tennessee. A slow, gray rain. I was tired, so I went straight to my hotel. A big, heavy man was walking up and down in the hotel lobby. Something about the way he moved made me think of a hungry dog looking for a bone. He had a big, fat, red face and a sleepy expression in his eyes. He introduced himself as Wentworth Caswell, Major Wentworth Caswell, from a fine southern family. Caswell pulled me into the hotel's barroom and yelled for a waiter. We ordered drinks. While we drank, he talked continually about himself, his family, his wife, and her family. He said his wife was rich. He showed me a handful of silver coins that he pulled from his coat pocket. By this time, I had decided that I wanted no more of him. I said good night. I went up to my room and looked out the window. It was ten o'clock, but the town was silent. A nice, quiet place, I said to myself as I got ready for bed. Just an ordinary, sleepy, southern town. I was born in the South myself, but I live in New York now. I write for a large magazine. My boss had asked me to go to Nashville. The magazine had received some stories and poems from a writer in Nashville named Azalea Adair. The editor liked her work very much. The publisher asked me to get her to sign an agreement to write only for his magazine. I left the hotel at nine o'clock the next morning to find Miss Adair. It was still raining. As soon as I stepped outside, I met Uncle Caesar. He was a big old black man with fuzzy gray hair. Uncle Caesar was wearing the strangest coat I had ever seen. It must have been a military officer's coat. It was very long, and when it was new, it had been gray. But now, rain, sun, and age had made it a rainbow of colors. Only one of the buttons was left. It was yellow, and as big as a fifty-cent coin. Uncle Caesar stood near a horse and carriage. He opened the carriage door and said softly, Step right in, sir. I'll take you anywhere in the city. I want to go to 861 Jasmine Street, I said, and I started to climb into the carriage. But the old man stopped me. Why do you want to go there, sir? What business is it of yours? I said angrily. Uncle Caesar relaxed and smiled. Nothing, sir, but it's a lonely part of town. Just step in and I'll take you there right away. 861 Jasmine Street had been a fine house once, but now it was old and dying. I got out of the carriage. That will be two dollars, sir. Uncle Caesar said. I gave him two one-dollar bills. As I handed them to him, I noticed that one had been torn in half and fixed with a piece of blue paper. Also, the upper right-hand corner was missing. Azalea Adair herself opened the door when I knocked. She was about fifty years old. Her white hair was pulled back from her small, tired face. She wore a pale yellow dress. It was old, but very clean. Azalea Adair led me into her living room. A damaged table, 
three chairs, and an old red sofa were in the center of the floor. Azalea Adair and I sat down at the table and began to talk. I told her about the magazine's offer. She told me about herself. She was from an old southern family. Her father had been a judge. Azalea Adair told me she had never traveled or even attended school. Her parents taught her at home with private teachers. We finished our meeting. I promised to return with the agreement the next day, and rose to leave. At that moment, someone knocked at the back door. Azalea Adair whispered a soft apology and went to answer the caller. She came back a minute later with bright eyes and pink cheeks. She looked ten years younger. You must have a cup of tea before you go, she said. She shook a little bell on the table, and a small black girl about twelve years old ran into the room. Azalea Dare opened a tiny old purse and took out a dollar bill. It had been fixed with a piece of blue paper, and the upper right hand corner was missing. It was the dollar I had given to Uncle Caesar. Go to Mr. Baker's store, Impey, she said, and get me twenty-five cents worth of tea and ten cents worth of sugar cakes, and please hurry. The child ran out of the room. We heard the back door close. Then the girl screamed, her cry mixed with a man's angry voice. Azalea Adair stood up. Her face showed no emotion as she left the room. I heard the man's rough voice and her gentle one. Then a door slammed, and she came back into the room. I am sorry, but I won't be able to offer you any tea after all, she said. It seems that Mr. Baker has no more tea. Perhaps he will find some for our visit tomorrow. We said goodbye. I went back to my hotel. Just before dinner, Major Wentworth Caswell found me. It was impossible to avoid him. He insisted on buying me a drink and pulled two one dollar bills from his pocket. Again, I saw a torn dollar fixed with blue paper with a corner missing. It was the one I gave Uncle Caesar. How strange, I thought. I wondered how Caswell got it. Uncle Caesar was waiting outside the hotel the next afternoon. He took me to Miss Adair's house and agreed to wait there until we had finished our business. Azalea Adair did not look well. I explained the agreement to her. She signed it. Then, as she started to rise from the table, Azalea Adair fainted and fell to the floor. I picked her up and carried her to the old red sofa. I ran to the door and yelled to Uncle Caesar for help. He ran down the street. Five minutes later, he was back with a doctor. The doctor examined Miss Adair and turned to the old black driver. Uncle Caesar, he said, run to my house and ask my wife for some milk and some eggs. Hurry. Then the doctor turned to me. She does not get enough to eat, he said. She has many friends who want to help her, but she is proud. Mrs. Caswell will accept help only from that old black man. He was once her family's slave. Mrs. Caswell, I said in surprise, I thought she was Azalea Adair. She was, the doctor answered, until she married Wentworth Caswell twenty years ago. But he's a hopeless drunk. He takes even the small amount of money that Uncle Caesar gives her.
After the doctor left, I heard Caesar's voice in the other room. Did he take all the money I gave you yesterday, Mrs. Azalea? Yes, Caesar, I heard her answer softly. He took both dollars. I went into the room and gave Azalea a dare fifty dollars. I told her it was from the magazine. Then Uncle Caesar drove me back to the hotel. A few hours later, I went out for a walk before dinner. A crowd of people was talking excitedly in front of a store. I pushed my way into the store. Major Caswell was lying on the floor. He was dead. Someone had found his body on the street. He had been killed in a fight. In fact, his hands were still closed into tight fists. But as I stood near his body, Caswell's right hand opened. Something fell from it and rolled near my feet. I put my foot on it, then picked it up and put it in my pocket. People said they believed a thief had killed him. They said Caswell had been showing everyone that he had fifty dollars, but when he was found, he had no money on him. I left Nashville the next morning. As the train crossed a river, I took out of my pocket the object that had dropped from Caswell's dead hand. I threw it into the river below. It was a button, a yellow button, the one from Uncle Caesar's coat. The Railway Crossing by Freeman Wills Crofts Read by Paul Panting Dunstan Thwaite looked at the railway crossing and decided that it was time for John Dunn to die. It was a very suitable place for a murder. There were trees all around, and they hid the trains which came so fast along the railway line. The nearest house was Thwaite's own, and this was also hidden by the trees. People and traffic did not use the crossing very often, and the big gates were kept locked. There was a small gate used by passengers going to the station, but at night it was always quiet. Thwaite was a worried man. He had to use sleeping powders to help him sleep. But after tonight, things were going to be different. The time had come to stop the blackmail. The time had come for John Dunn to die. It all began five years earlier. Thwaite worked in the offices of a large company and his only money was the money that the company paid him. It was not much, but it was enough. Then he met the beautiful Miss Hilda Lorraine and asked her to marry him. She came from an important family who was supposed to be very rich, but in fact, they had less money than Thwaite had thought. He learned that he would have to pay for the wedding himself, and he did not have enough money for the expensive kind of wedding that Miss Lorraine wanted. So Thwaite stole a thousand pounds by changing the figures in the company's books. He planned to put the money back after he was married, but someone discovered that it was missing. Thwaite kept quiet. Another man was thought to be the thief, and he lost his job. Thwaite still said nothing. But John Dunn worked in the same office. He worked closely with Thwaite and guessed Thwaite's crime. He searched through the company's books until he found what he was looking for. Then he went to Thwaite. 
sorry to have to ask you, Mr. Thwaite," he said. "I need a hundred pounds for my son. He's in a bit of trouble, you see." "But you don't have a son," said Thwaite. Dunn just smiled. It wasn't a very nice smile. "A hundred pounds," he said again. And then Thwaite knew that he was being blackmailed. He paid Dunn one hundred pounds, and Dunn said nothing more for a year. During that time, Thwaite got married. Then the day came when Dunn asked him for more money. Two hundred and fifty pounds, he said to Thwaite. I can't pay, began Thwaite. But he did. Either he paid, or he went to prison. It went on for five years, and each time, Dunn wanted more money. Thwaite found it difficult to live on the money that he was left with. His wife liked expensive things: an expensive house, an expensive car, visits to expensive restaurants. She also discovered that some of the money her husband was paid each year seemed to disappear. He tried to lie about it, but he knew that she thought he was paying to keep another woman. Oh, how he hated John Dunn! Something must happen. And then, he remembered the railway crossing. It was not a new idea. Weeks before, he had thought about what could happen there. The idea came when the doctor gave him some powders to help him sleep. He thought about giving Dunn enough of them to kill him. But then, he got a better idea. Although he was afraid, Thwaite slowly realized that murder was the only answer to his problem. Then Dunn asked for more money. Five hundred pounds, Mister Thwaite. Dunn told him. Five hundred, said Thwaite. Why not ask for the moon? You'll get neither one nor the other. Five hundred, repeated Dunn calmly. It was then that Thwaite decided to murder the other man. He pretended to think about the money for a moment, then he said, "Come to my house tomorrow night, and we'll talk." He remembered his wife was going to be away in London all night, and bring those papers from the office which you want me to look at. All right," said Dunn. The following evening, Thwaite put two hundred pounds in his pocket. Then he put one half of his sleeping powders into a whisky bottle. There was only enough whisky for two glasses, but there was an unopened bottle next to it. Next, he put a hammer into one pocket of his overcoat, and a torch into the other pocket. The coat was outside the door of his study. Lastly, he moved the hands on his watch and on the study clock forward. By ten minutes, those extra ten minutes would give him his alibi. Thwaite knew that he must be extra careful. He knew that people at the office thought there was some secret between him and Dunn, a secret that Thwaite didn't want anyone to know. If Dunn is killed, he thought, they'll wonder if it was really an accident. Or if I murdered him, but if his plan went well, the police would believe that he hadn't left the house. Thwaite sat down to wait for John Dunn. He thought about what he was going to do: murder. He could almost see his hand holding the hammer above Dunn. Could hear the awful sound of it crashing down onto the man's head. He could see Dunn's dead body. Dead, all except the eyes, which looked at Thwaite, followed him everywhere he went. 
he tried to calm himself. He remembered why he was doing this. When Dunn was dead, his problems were over. Half an hour later, Dunn arrived. Jane opened the door. Jane was the servant who lived in the house with Thwaite and his wife. She brought Dunn into the study. Thwaite smiled in a friendly way. Oh, good. You've brought those papers for me to see, Dunn. Thank you. After Jane left, the two men looked at each other. Give me the papers, Thwaite said. I'll look at them now that you've brought them. Fifteen minutes later, he gave the papers back to Dunn and sat back in his chair. Now, about that other matter. He got up. But why not have a drink first? No, thank you, said Dunn. He looked afraid. <laughs> what are you afraid of? said Thwaite. He gave Dunn the opened whiskey bottle and two glasses. We can both drink the same whiskey if you like. Here, you do it. After a moment, Dunn put whiskey into each glass. Then he waited until Thwaite drank before he drank his own. Thwaite watched him. How long before the other man began to feel sleepy? Thwaite needed all of one sleeping powder to make him sleep, but Dunn did not usually take them. Listen, Dunn, said Thwaite. I haven't got five hundred pounds, but I can give you this. He took the money from his pocket and put it on the table. Dunn counted it. Two hundred, he said with a laugh. Are you trying to be funny? I'm not saying it will be the last, said Thwaite. Take it now and be pleased that you've got it. Dunn shook his head. Five hundred, Mr. Thwaite. I've told you, I can't do it, said Thwaite. And I won't do it. You can tell everyone what I did. I don't care anymore. It's been five years, and I've done a lot of good work for the company during that time. I saved them a lot more than a thousand pounds. I'll sell this house and pay them back. I'll take my punishment. Then I'll go and live in another country and give myself a new name. And your wife? said Dunn. My wife will leave the country first, Thwaite told him. She'll wait for me to come out of prison. It won't be more than two or three years. So you can take the two hundred pounds or you can do your worst. The powder in the whiskey was beginning to make Dunn sleepy. He looked stupidly at Thwaite and Thwaite began to worry. Had he given the other man too much? He looked at the clock. There was not much time left. Will you take it or leave it? asked Thwaite. Five hundred, said Dunn in a heavy voice. I want five hundred. You can go and do your worst said Thwaite. Dunn held out a shaking hand. Come on, pay me. Thwaite began to worry again. Are you feeling all right, Dunn? I have some more whiskey. He opened the other bottle and put some whiskey in Dunn's glass. Dunn drank it and it seemed to make him feel better. Uh, that was strange, he said. I didn't feel very well, but I feel a little better now. If you're going to catch your train, you must go, said Thwaite. Tell me tomorrow what you finally decide to do. Take the two hundred with you. Dunn thought for a moment, then picked up the money. He looked at his watch, then looked at the study clock. Your clock is wrong, he said. I have ten more minutes. 
Wrong, said Thwaite. He looked at his own watch. It's your watch that's wrong. Look at mine. Dunn looked and seemed unable to understand it. He stood up and almost fell back again. Thwaite hid a smile. This was how he wanted Dunn to be. You're not feeling well, he said. I'll take you to the station. Wait until I get my coat. Now that the time was here, Thwaite felt cool and calm. He put on his coat, feeling the hammer in the pocket, then went back into the study. We'll go out this way, he said. There was a side door from the study into the garden. Thwaite closed it silently, and it locked automatically behind him. It was his plan to return that way, go in quietly again, and then to change the clock and his watch back to the right time. Then he would shout, Good night, and close the front door very loudly, pretending that somebody had left just then. Next, he would call Jane and ask for some coffee, making sure that she saw the clock. Then, if the police asked her later, Jane could say that Thwaite did not leave the house and that Dunn went to catch his train at the right time. It was a dry night, but very dark. A train carrying freight went slowly by. Thwaite smiled to himself. There were plenty of freight trains at that time of the night. He needed one of them to hide his crime for him. He planned to hit Dunn on the head with the hammer, then put his body on the railway line. A freight train would do the rest. Slowly, the two men walked on, Thwaite holding Dunn's arm. A light wind moved among the trees. Thwaite gently pushed the half-asleep Dunn forwards. He put his hand into his pocket for the hammer and stopped. His keys. They were still inside the house and he could not get back in without them. He would have to ring the front doorbell. His alibi was destroyed. It was a bad mistake. Everything was wrong now. He couldn't go on with the murder. Most murderers make mistakes, thought Thwaite, trying to calm himself. I've been the same. But he was shaking with fear as he thought about the mistake. Suddenly, he could not walk another step with Dunn. Good night, he said to the other man. And before they reached the crossing, he turned and walked back to the house. For ten minutes, Thwaite walked up and down outside until he began to feel calm again. Then he rang the bell. A few moments later, Jane opened the door. Th thank you, Jane, he said. I went to see Mr. Dunn over the crossing, and I forgot my keys. He went to bed a happier man. He was not a murderer. When he was eating his breakfast the next morning, he decided what to do. I'll tell them at the office that I stole the thousand pounds, he said to himself. I'll take my punishment and then I can have some peace again. It suddenly seemed so easy. Until Jane came in. Have you heard the news, sir? She said. Mr Dunn was killed by a train on the crossing last night. A man who was working on the railway line found him this morning. Thwaite slowly went white. Jane was looking at him strangely. What was she thinking? What story did he tell her the night before? He couldn't remember. Done! Killed! He said. How terrible, Jane! I'll go down. 
The body was in a small railway building near the line. There was a policeman outside. A sad accident, Mr. Thwaite, the policeman said. You knew the man, didn't you, sir? He worked in my office, replied Thwaite. He was with me last night, discussing business. I suppose this happened on his way home. It's terrible. It's very sad, sir, said the policeman. But accidents will happen. I know that, said Thwaite. But I wish he hadn't drunk so much of my whiskey. I was going to walk with him to the station. The policeman looked closely at Thwaite. And did you, sir? No, said Thwaite. The cold night air seemed to make him feel better. I turned back before the crossing. The policeman said no more. But later that day, two more policemen came to the office. Have they talked to Jane? wondered Thwaite. Again, he told them, I left Dunn before we reached the railway crossing. They wrote down what he said to them, then went away. Next day, they came back. There were things that Thwaite could not explain to them. Why did the whiskey bottle contain what was left of a sleeping powder? Why was the study clock wrong by ten minutes? At dinner time earlier on the same evening, Jane had noticed that it was right. And why was a hammer found in his overcoat pocket? Then the police found papers in Dunn's house. The handwriting on them was Dunn's. It told the story of Thwaite and the thousand pounds, and it told how Thwaite was a thief. The police then discovered that money taken from Thwaite's bank account over the last five years always appeared a few days later in Dunn's bank book. Lastly, the time of death was known to be 10.30pm because Dunn's blood was found on the train that went through the railway crossing at that time. It was also seven minutes before Jane opened the front door to let Thwaite back in. At first, Thwaite had no answers to all their questions. Finally, on his last morning, he told them the true story. Then he went to his death, bravely.